he's uh, in the hospital and doing better. I believe that God has already heard people's prayers and that uh, God is honoring those prayers and that God cares so much. Are you aware this morning how much God cares for us? He really does. God loves me, and I will never make the statement, I'm his favorite. God chooses me over everybody. No, he doesn't. He loves everybody the same this morning. and He loves our mayor, and just we wish him, our church wishes him a speedy recovery, a speedy healing. I go by what the Bible says. I don't have any other answers. If you expect me to come out with uh, something that Confucius said or Mao Tse-sung, uh, the former leader of China, uh, if you want me to say something that Marx said or Lenin or Stalin said, I don't have any answers for you, but I have some answers from my God and uh, that comes uh, strictly from the Word of God. I have nothing else for you this morning, so don't expect anything else. Uh, thank you, God, for loving me, loving me, loving me. I've been singing some old choruses the past several weeks, some old, old songs, old hymns. We will never forget the good old hymns. Uh, people say, do you have hymnals here? Yeah, we can bring out a stack of uh, hymnals. Uh, there's not very many songs that uh, our family doesn't know. And if we forget some of the lyrics, all we got to do is say, what is it, Holly? And she knows it about all of them. Once in a great while, I will stump her with a song from way back in the 50s or 60s. She'll say, Dad, I've never heard of that. Well, I don't expect her to know those lyrics, but sometimes I have to point and say, help me out, Holly. I'm going to sing a couple of old uh, courses. They've been around for a number of decades. Uh, I just don't know how old they are. Some of you got to start writing uh, seat back there. Sunday that you want to sing a song that might be packing the bag down. We've got to have some time.
Good morning. Here we are. Holly and I were just talking, and like, you know, people are going to start going under pressure if we don't see the sun. Guess what? We have the sun. We have the sun. That could be an. Oh, no, that could have been fun. That could be its own message all by itself. So, uh, God is good. He's good on our rainy days and our sunny days. And every day in between. How's that? God is good all the time. All right. I do have something funny. This one I thought was kind of cute. Change up a little bit. All right. So a burglar broke into a home and was looking around. He heard his soft voice say, Jesus is watching you. Thinking it was just his imagination, he continued his search. Again, the voice said, Jesus is watching you. He turned his flashlight around, finally saw a parrot in a cage. He asked the parrot if he was the one that talking. The one talking. The parrot said, yes. <laughs> That's not odd. The parrot is, uh, uh, let's see. he asked the parrot what his name was. The parrot said, Moses. The burglar asked, what kind of people would name a parrot Moses? The parrot said, the same kind of people who would name their German shepherd Jesus. <laughs> He's watching. <laughs> oh, God is good for everything that we do and all things that pertain to life and godliness. I like, there are so many verses as you kind of start putting things together that it, it just makes sense. I, I you know, maybe that's the rational part of me that uh, looks at things. I like to, I like to figure things out. Am I the only one that does that? Try to understand, try to get my arms around things. Well, the point is that we talked about that last week just a little bit. People can be destroyed by lack of knowledge, meaning is, is there a certain amount of knowledge that we can attain? Can we study to show ourselves approved, a workman? rightly dividing the word of truth is there something we can attain and go after that will better prepare us does anybody like to be prepared does anybody like to go into something woefully unprepared that i like that phrase that you walk into something you're there you hear you're ready for that something but you're you haven't prepared and you're like oh no and i kind of gave that analogy i think a few weeks ago maybe about going into a test how many know you the ones that tried to cram for a test the night before and you get there and you're there ready to do the test and you're like oh i kind of remember that one but mm, it's not there why isn't it there because i didn't take the time to prepare and you know in our lives we can talk about so many things that things do come on us unawares and it's one of those things that as we're making preparation if you're going on a long journey the bible talk has some stories and examples of somebody that was going to build a tower shouldn't he first count the cost and this morning I want to talk to you about how we can be measuring our blessings by our faith. And I, I like this phrase. I kind of rephrased it differently. Our blessings are proportionate to the size of our faith. So chew on that for just a moment. And let, let's take some time going into the word. I want to take, with, take you with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to just read a little bit there, starting in verse 1. And I want to talk a little bit about Elisha this morning. So many good object lesson characters in the bible to come up with some example stuff from but this is a good one and i want to kind of go through i have an i have an niv here that i can't, i like the bit of translation so i'm gonna i'm gonna read from this one a bit so in verse one the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to elisha so some i'm gonna read along follow with me because i want i want to take this a bit uh, slow at first your servant my husband is dead Okay, so stop for a moment. So, the wife of a man from the company of prophets, somebody that has been devoting his time to God, making time, she has singled out Elisha, one of the prophets, and sought him out. Okay? How many know when it comes down to the problems we face, the struggles we're going through, at some point we get desperate enough that we've got to say, I need something, I need resource, I need to find the man of God, the house of God, God, <laughs> the word. I need something. She was desperate. And what, 
Now notice, and there is some careful wordsmanship here that I want to point out as we're kind of moving along, if that's okay. A bit of expositional type discussion this morning. Your servant, my husband, is dead. Did you catch that? Your servant, the one that's serving you, the one that devoted his time and effort, is dead. Do you think she's feeling some frustration from having to go through some difficulty in life? And yet here she is seeking out the man of God, the prophet, trying to find an answer for her, her challenge. And then, as if that wasn't enough, here she's trying to make this connection. Now, now she gives out the story. And listen to how she lays out her challenge, her problems. Your servant, my husband's dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. I'm reminding you of how he stood, where he stood, and the covenant relationship he stood in. I'm reminding you, prophet, man of God, where my husband was in relation to God. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. I don't even want to get into the semantics. Obviously, something happened there. They've, they've now got a financial obligation that has happened and whatever it is whatever they we could say that people have said that levy that criticism you know there was slavery in the bible yeah but people it wasn't it wasn't quite the same as the connotation we have in modern vernacular in this case people would indenture themselves and say yeah that's how i'm gonna pay off my debt i'm gonna give you my service i'm indenturing myself to your service <laughs> well whatever happened here something's coming calling there's a debt being called and there's something now being thrust on the two sons that are left over. Again, can you imagine this wife, this mom? And she's having to live life. She's with her two sons. She's lost her husband. So her boys are what she's got. And now something's coming calling, taking her sons. Talk about getting to the end of your rope. Talking about getting to the... And if she's not done. Elisha replied to her. Now get this. And... And there's, a, there's a, such a wonderful lesson in the middle of this. Get this in verse 2. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? What, what, <laughs> what would you do if you're in that woman's shoes? She just laid out a challenge. My husband's dead. I am now having to figure out life on my own with my sons. And now this past obligation, financial burden has come back calling and looming large. And I may lose that that I have. And the potential livelihood, whatever that entails. And she's coming to grab Elisha. I need help. We've all been there at that point. I need you, God. Man of God, come, bring your word. What can you... And he says, how can I help you? <laughs> and, and I'm going to give you some references to that because Jesus did the same thing a time or two as well. Do you think Elisha was asking for informational purposes? Probably not. Because guess what he does? He doesn't even allow for an answer. He immediately keeps talking. Tell me. He stops. He stops as he can say, tell me. What do you have in your house? Sounds like that story I gave a month or so ago when it was the same discussion between God and Moses. The guy that was like, God, I, I'm the one that stutters. I can't form the right words. How am I, in the world am I ever going to go to Pharaoh? You better pick another guy. I'm not your servant. I'm not the guy. And we get to that point when it, he comes to a crossroads and God asks him when he's like, how do I cross the sea now? What am I doing? And God says, what's in your hand, Moses? Staff? Just a staff? Kind of like the same thing he asked to Gideon. Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon looks around. Who are you looking at? Not me. He asks this woman, what do you have in your house? Can you imagine her? She being a bit incredulous. Like, wait a second. I just came to you and unloaded all my problems. How many of us have started that way with God? God, here's my laundry list of what's going on in my life. Where are you? And I need my answer. And I'm not knocking her. We've all been there and been frustrated. But there's some great, there's some great object lesson learning that the man of God, Elisha, was wanting to show through and show God's goodness through her. And do more than just meet her need. There's a, there's a careful consideration here that I am trying to get across this morning. And I wanna, that's why I want to talk about our blessings that we want. We cultivate. We want blessings. We covet blessings. Right? We want mountaintops. We don't want valleys. 
But is it true that our blessings are proportionate to the size of our faith? What does that mean? So let's continue again here. Tell me what's in your house. And what she answered. Your servant has nothing at all. How many have been there as well? We, we have something, we have a need, we're frustrated. The man of God comes calling and says, or God comes calling and whispers in a still small voice, what's in your hand? What talents have I given you? What blessings have, you, have brought you to this point? What's in your house, man? And she says, I don't have anything. But she did, then she got to thinking a little. It's like the memory banks jog just a little as she's going through this discussion. Oh, there's a little oil. There's a little substance. It's not much. It's bad. That's why I'm here. Fix my problem. And, and I, I can say this so tongue-in-cheek because I have been there too. God, I've, whether I've gotten into this issue my own, by my own volition or I found myself here fallen among thieves, whatever. There's so many different analogies in the Bible, right? Whatever it is, I'm in this hard straits, this hard way. There is no way out. You've got to bail me out, God, man of God. And he says, what's in your house? And she's like, nothing. Well, maybe a little something. Maybe a little substance. There's a little oil. And listen to what his response is to her. Elisha said, verse 3, go round, ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Wait a second. Involve those out there around you. Involve those that can help you provide a hedge. Involve others in in the blessing that's going to come. Sounds like another part of the Bible that says, prepare for rain. Get ready for the rains, not physically, but the, the spiritual rain. In that case, it was a physical rain, that story I'm referring to. That's a good one, too, if you want to go back to that one. But anyway, she says, go around to your neighbors. Ask for empty jars. Don't just ask for a few. He gives her, that's an interesting dis- direction. She doesn't know where he's going. He's not giving her the instruction. You know, many times I've thought the same thing. I thought, God, wow, things would be so easy if you just give me the manual and tell me play by play. This, 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 things check out. It's all good. And I guess by me wanting that, I'm taking God creating something wonderful through the situation. You know, like I was talking last week, and I'm this message is really a follow-on from last week's message because perhaps there's a David or a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego inside of one of you that needs a tough time to make that show up. Does, our, does the resolve we need to go through life's challenges, does it show up instantly, or does it sometimes come up when we face adversity? She was at her bottom. She had hit bottom here. She, but she just wanted him to fix it and bail her out. But Elisha responds with, involve a community. Involve others that can pool support. Go out and find those with vials. And don't look for just a few. I want you to, and she's like, wait a second. Okay, so I'm going to borrow pots and pitchers. I don't see the end game. I don't understand what you're saying. Involve others in my community in my effort. It takes a village sometimes. I like that phrase from that one book. Go out, ask but don't just ask for a few. Meaning, where is your minds at? And can you envision something coming? How can you prepare your fields for the harvest? Are you able to do so? So don't just get a few pictures. Get as many as you can. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. And pour oil into all the jars. As each is filled, put it to the side. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And it sounds, like, it sounds like other places in the Bible when people are told, but I need a healing. And they say, go wash in the muddy Jordan. Why would I do that? Why, these unconventional things that you're asking of me, why would I do that? Why not just fix my issue? And the question is, would we, if God, and here's my question to each one of you. It's the question to me that I ask myself. If God gave me an instant microwave fix to my problems, would I learn the lesson, and would I grow through it, or would I end up right back there again next time, next time, next week, next month, next year? Would I end up circling the barn? Would I end up circling the desert for 40 years like a certain group of people that could have made it to the promised land in a 
pretty quick jump. Would I circle the barn a few times waiting for my moment of graduation? So he says, I want you to list others in this help. I want you to get resource potential. Even though you can't see the solution, you've got some resource in the house. I know there's some oil in there. There's a, there is a measure of faith there. I want to use it and I want to work through it. So go get the vessels needed to carry my blessing. And, and your faith, be it unto you, according to your, the size of your faith, how much is going to be, how much are you going to see? Don't just get a few vessels. I want as many as you can get your hands on and go in and shut yourself in. It's time to sequester with God and spend time with him. So what she do? This is kind of exciting then. Then we see it. She left him afterwards, shut the door behind her and the, her sons. Oh, her kids are the ones that are subject to the problem are all part of the solution. They're all part of the miracle as well. So. The sons brought her the jars she kept pouring. When the jars were full, she said to her son, bring her another. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Wait a second. What just happened here? I was so invested in working through the iterations of what the man of God said, stepping through the motions of let's follow the word in detail. Let's follow those precepts. Let's study to show ourselves approved. And the whole time I was working through, you wait a second. You mean when I quit focusing on my problems and focus on what God, what the word of God, the man of God said, I was experiencing a miracle the whole time and was unaware, except as she put jars aside and kept filling. Wait a second. Sounds like a five loaves and two, bat, uh, two fish kind of thing, doesn't it? Sounds like it all over again. Sounds like our God who works in multiplication wants to have you be the miracle. Sounds like that if God simply gave her the pot of money and released the debt from her kids, would they be back in that same position the next month, the next year, the next whatever? That's the tough reality that we have to ask ourselves. So when I look at this woman, listen to what she said. She gets down to the point. The jars were full. She said to her son, bring me another. He replied, there's not a jar left. What's she thinking now? I wish I'd have went and got more jars. If I'd have known what God was going to do, I would have made room for his gifts. I would have not limited that one, the one that is coming to save and do all these wonderful things. I wouldn't have struck the ground just three times. I would have struck it more times. Uh, so many different analogies in the Bible that if, if I can allow God, he's, what is God limited by? What is God limited by? That's actually a good question just by itself. What is God limited by? When, when the apostles would travel from town to town trying to do something great, and then they would go in and they couldn't do anything in a certain area, what would they say? We're shaking the dust off our feet, and what are we doing? We're moving on to another that will have us. You think, well, we all want a blessing. Sure, but how many of us are making room for God? How many of us are allowing him to dwell and us be his habitation? I want God to use me, but I can say those words flippantly. It's a whole different thing to make room for his blessings and to recognize, wait a second. This is a tough one. This is almost like the prodigal son type analogy. Remember, the prodigal son was blue as living. Dad, I'm doing my own thing. I don't need you or mom or anybody else. Give me my inheritance. I know how to live life. I'm on my own. Peace out. We got to do that one again sometime because I love that lesson in Luke 15. But he's out. And he blows it. He wasn't prepared. And so it's that moment that he's living, he's eating the feed the pigs are eating. <laughs> and at that moment, it finally dawns on him, wait a second. My father's servants are doing better than I am today. Why am I wallowing in the mire with the pigs? Why am I spending time when God's provision is way beyond anything that I can Imagine, dream up, be a part of. And so with the woman, again, now I'm going back to her because I'm going back to this analogy. She took as many jars as her faith allowed her to perceive. The prophet told her, get as many as you can. She should have spent two more days grabbing jars. I mean, was she trying to be, was she trying to build up something for, you know, uh, 
just material? No. He was trying to have her see that if you don't limit God, it's amazing what he can accomplish through each one of us. So what happens then in verse, we can kind of finish that verse out then. Not a jar left. When the jars were, there was no more jars, the oil stopped. She went, told the man of God, and he said, I mean, again, she's like, whoa, I don't know what happened. She came out, look at this miracle that just happened. And then what's he say? Go sell the oil, pay your debts. You can, and he even says, you can live on what's left. I don't know the follow-on. I've heard some discourse on that. Basically, what she did allow for set her up for her life at that point. <laughs> she, she, so you, what else do we need? She might be able to set up her whole village if she'd have had enough faith. If she'd have went out and kept getting jars, give me some barrels. Give me some. Somebody needs to understand that I'm the one that limits God's ability to work in my life. I'm the one. My own, my own construct, my own challenges I've been through that's brought me here that makes me think there's no hope. I'm the one that limits the Holy One of old. Is there anything too difficult for God? How's that for a rhetorical question? Is there anything too difficult for God? He wants our hearts cry. He wants us to resonate, something in us to resonate with him that what we have has been in our hands the whole time. We just could not see the supernatural provision that God allows for in the midst of our difficulty. She responds that she had nothing except that little oil. But with God in our life, little is much when God is in it. What I think is insignificant and small, the little child that brought, how are we going to feed so many, Jesus? And he says, what do we have? What resource do you have? we got two fish and a few loaves. All I need. All I need. And, and yet, it's still the same group that can go just after that and still doubt God's provision. And we do it too. How many times, and I would ask you this this morning. I mean, just so much nostalgia. I'm kind of thinking up here. You know, I like the phrase, count your many blessings, name them one by one. How many of us here can say, rightfully so, God has already brought me through so much. And yet we still fall on hard times and will doubt his goodness and, and question his ability to provide for us. But if he's done it before, can he do it again? I said that, I quoted that song last week. We, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. Why doesn't he continually do it? Because something between these two hands right here tends to limit him and his abilities to work on my behalf. And I, uh, I like this, that James 1, 3, and 4 talks about the trying of your faith. Like, oh, Sean, don't talk about tests and trials. I didn't even like tests in school. I don't want tests in life. But the point is, you don't know what you think you know until you're tested. Let me say this. Let me phrase this again. Okay. You get into school. I've had classes now, and they call them executive education now. You go for a class. I sit, sit for a day. I listen to somebody lecture. You take home some materials, and that's great. But you know what? And I might, I learn. I'm not saying I don't learn something. You listen to this. I hope you're learning something. I'm not giving a quiz. Well, at least I don't think so. Quiz next week. No, I'm kidding. But you know what? How many times do we know when you're in class and the teacher's like, here's this property, this property, this property, quiz Friday. What happens? Oh, a whole other thing kicks in. Oh, I can't, I can't just rely on him saying that word. I need to know that. that that's going to come out on the quiz. And I, it, I can just, we talk in the Bible about hearing. People don't hear. And we can do that with people, but we can do it with the word. We can hear the word. You can hear this morning. But that whole parable analogy of talking about the seeds, where we can plant seeds in stony ground or rocky soil and it doesn't grow, or we can plant it in good fertilized ground where it grows up and springs up and becomes very fruitful. So what happens to the word in us? We've got to hear these words. We've got to resolve within ourselves that something is going to happen with it, that I'm going to have learning. And I'm not, you might say there's going to be a test. Well, there is, but the testing of our faith is what produces patience, perseverance, strength. I didn't make up the rules, <laughs> but I do know this. When we, when we learn by our challenges, they stay. Now, I can't remember all of them, but I remember a really good teacher I had in the eighth grade that wanted us to learn all the presidents in order. And I used to know them all. I 
for some reason that little recall, I didn't keep that one up, but now I'm you know, Van Buren, I, I can't, Johnson, <laughs> I don't have them anymore there. But it's, it's th there are some things, have you had a very influential teacher that pushed you, challenged you, and you still remember some of the teaching from that person today? Why? Because there's something in our memory banks that gets it seared in when we have to go through something difficult and we make our way through. That's when we truly grow. That's when we truly learn. And that's when God can work more on our behalf. The lessons I gave you last week, David doesn't just simply become king. He had to go through a Goliath. And show up and prove himself worthy by how? Not because of him, but because he knew who God was through him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had to stand when it was tough. It was easier to go with the flow. It would have been easier to bow to the king and the idols and not be picked out. But just like I said last week, you can just know it now, O king. We're not going to bow. And even if God doesn't deliver us in this life, he is delivering us from your hand. That boldness, that, that true grit, what does that come from? It doesn't come from the mountaintops, let me just say. <laughs> right? Unfortunately, those valleys that we go through that at the time, we think of them as terrible and difficult to our very core. And yet coming through those things, being found to more all the beautiful things that God has for us, in store for us. James said it so well. It's an exercise. Like, we talk about going to the gym. Christy helps work with people for a living. Like, it would be great if we could sit on the couch and be like, potato chip, soda, look at my biceps. And they just get bigger and bigger all the time. The more I eat, the more I sit here, the more I just keep Bulking up, I'm having trouble. Now I have to get to the bigger shirt next week. No, it's, it doesn't work that way. Why? It takes some exercise. Your faith is no different. Your faith is no different. You need to exercise. The trying of our very core being is what produces in us the beautiful work that God's able to do. The beautiful melody he's able to do through us. So, goodness. I had lots of notes, and I just keep kind of going right through them. I love this. Sometimes you have to go through the trials and tribulations for the miracle of God to make manifest. That woman, if she had had her issues just wiped out quickly, would she, we don't know any more of her story. I'm going to guess she became a very big vocal mouthpiece for what God can do. I love that song, um, My Name is Lazarus. And I think, I love the premise of the song and such witty writing that we could go through and talk about, you know, do we doubt God's goodness? Can he really do what he says he's going to do? And, you know, here's a difficult situation. I may have went through something. I can remember a blessing, but this is tough. And several, until we get to Lazarus. And he's like, I'd like to testify. God brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to say what? What? What is it? And, and I love this analogy. Again, people, will get, people get down on God for the very thing that Elisha did as an echo of God's goodness. He came to the woman and said, her, given her spiel of what's going wrong, and he says, what's really going on? And then he says, what's in your house? And her first reaction is, nothing. I have no provision. I don't have what I need. And yet, Everything that we do that we step through becomes a stepping stone to something else God is able to do through us. I, uh, I, you know, I'm a movie buff. I love the movie uh, Bruce Almighty. And I, I, it's a cute movie, you know, haha. Uh, but if you were God for the day, how would you react? And what would you do about life's problems? And it's the things we, just like that character did, and I love that, that the difficult times he went through made everything more special, made you appreciate things more made everything in life sweeter. And I love the phrase they use in that, be the miracle, meaning, wait a second. It, God can do anything he wants. And this is one of those things I do as a, this is not just engineering. This is just me in general, the, the, the part of Sean that likes to question and quiz. But I've asked this question of God. How come we're here? How come I'm here? You ever ask that question? 
Why are you here today in this life, living at this time, at this point in history? Why are you here? And does, why would God have you here for such a time as this? Because God has something special. When we talk about God giving us time, talents, gifts, abilities, he's done something through us. He's given us free will and creative expression to make wonderful melody with our lives, an instrument of righteousness for his name's sake. So the point is, God has shown us through his word over and over and over, and this story is another example. God's not here to be Santa and quickly give you a present and fix your life issues. God's here to help you develop through, just like we do our kids that we love and care for and nurture. We don't want them to be brats that can't live and cope in life. We want them to be mature adults that know how to handle themselves when life and challenge comes calling. God's no different. A loving father caringly guiding us, correcting us, leading us into all good things. And so, of course, he does. I've got so many good verses that I was putting down as part of this. Ephesians 6, 10, 11. We could talk about how we put on that full armor of God in order to stand against those things when they come calling. And the shield of faith in Ephesians 6, uh, other things talking about there. I, but I, I, this is kind of an interesting premise that I want to leave you with as we're kind of finishing this discussion. Is So why is this important? And I look at this, and I wasn't going to give, I'm not giving much credence to the enemy of our soul. But the point is, the challenge we go through coming from that one that tries to take from us and wants to tempt and would go to God, dare to go to God and say, what about that Job? And when God says, consider my servant Job, well, let's test him and he won't serve you anymore. The meaning, meaning is that in us to want to go better, to go farther. And I ask this question about the enemy when it comes to that enemy of our soul. Meaning, if, if, I, if we look at the enemy of our soul, and we, I would ask this question, are you a threat to him? Are you a threat to the works of darkness by how we handle life? You might say, Sean, I'm barely enough to get out of bed in the morning and keep my own head above water. How many vessels do you have? What's in your house? And it sounds like you need more vessels to be ready for what God has in store for you. God didn't put us on this life to just absorb, take from others, and just get by. There's nothing, there's no story in the Bible that gives us that easy pass in life. It actually gives us the phrase, you're more than conquerors through him who loved us. God will fight our battles. He will equip us. He will prepare us. He gives us the wisdom and knowledge. I've got these are verses behind every one of these. He'll give us the strength. Everything you need, he provides. We trust him and have faith, knowing he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask. Those aren't wimpy promises that are designed for us to sit on the couch and hope our faith exercise looks like eating a chip and a soda or something like that. So I ask this question. Are you a threat to the works of darkness? And there's some funny analogies I had here that are you a threat? If Satan and his demons had a board meeting and your name came up on the board... What would they say? Would they say, you're one of those most feared enemies? They need to keep as many people harassing as possible and opposing you? Or would they say, gentlemen, <laughs> no threat there. It's enough for them to get out of bed in the morning and get up and barely provide for their own sustenance, let alone be a threat to the works of darkness. Compare and contrast that to last week with David. David walks on the battlefield and the enemy <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? I just awa awoken the man of God. This woman, in her desperation, no, the no faith left. There's no nothing in the house. Okay, maybe there's a little provision in the house. And Elisha says, you need to get vials and grab a community of supporters and be it unto you according to your faith. That's when the vials stopped filling. When her faith was done, that's when the vials filled up and the, the flow stopped. He still took care of all her needs. He could have done abundantly more beyond what she even had dreamt or asked. What can God do through you and I? <laughs> what limits you? The, your, the, the things, the challenges, the tribulations, the trials we've been through, we limit us. It's not the Holy One of old that limits us. He limits us. And I love this, 1 John 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The analogy is you pitted against the world. What is that? I'm not. I'm one person compared to the world. But he who is in me is greater than all things. What does that mean? He and I are a majority. 
God and I together are majority shareholders over this life's problems. There is nothing that is too difficult for God. I can just keep thinking of more and more things like that. So I ask this question. How many demons do you have on your personal detail? How many demons are assigned to you because you're a threat? Well, Sean, I don't want to go out just being a threat. Well, maybe, maybe that's not the way you think about life. But I do want to be a, more blessed to give than receive. I have been given talents, gifts, abilities, and things. God gave me breath this morning. He didn't give me breath to just sustain me and get up and go to bed and then do it again tomorrow. He gave you, he put you at such a time as this. He gave us life and breath, talents, gifts, abilities, and he gave you some provision. There's some oil in the house. We've got to grab that community of supporters. We've got to be in the word. We've got to know what the word says. My sheep know his voice, my voice. If we're listening, if we're there, 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be steadfast. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. But I know whom I believe and who I'm persuaded is able to keep that which I've committed against that day. Psalm 121 and 3 says, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will never slumber. The God we have is omnipotent. Nothing is impossible for God. Luke 1 and 37. Pray with me this morning as we're ending our giving. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness, your blessing. Lord, so many things that pertain to life and godliness that is in your word. Your word is rich and true. And Lord, I'm just mindful. We, every one of us wake up and we, I know we're not guaranteed a trouble-free life. And, and that can be frustrating at times when we look at the difficulty we go through and think, enough, Lord, I, I don't have enough provision. And what we don't realize in our, our, our feebleness, and, and forgive us for that, Lord, we don't grasp many times that you and I are a majority and that if we would simply call out, that act of surrender is not, is not somehow giving up the fight. It actually is taking the fight to another level. David didn't go out to Goliath by himself. He went out saying, oh, no, you don't attack my God and know, knew who he was in you. Lord, help us get that. Help us grasp that reality that you and I together are a majority share, shareholder. You and I, life's problems don't look the same. And we may be at the end of our rope, but you are there to help provide that provision. Be it unto us according to your word. Lord, I thank you for your blessing this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.